to the book of Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. The Bible says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me? Seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Then Abraham said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Those, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then the, he brought him outside and said, Look now towards the north and count the stars, if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Verse 7, Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all this to him, and he cut them in two, down, uh, in two, down the middle, and placed each piece opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, a deep slip fell upon him, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abraham, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them and they will afflict them 400 years and also the nation whom they serve I will judge afterwards they shall come out with great positions now as for you you shall go to your fathers in peace you shall be buried at a good old age but in the fourth generation, they shall return here for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. It came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, To your descendants I have given this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river of Euphrates. Now, I'm talking this night on the message, the blood of the covenant. The blood of the covenant. We are looking at the main topic of the teaching in this summit on what is the impact of a covenant in relationships. And it is good for us to know that marriage is a covenant. That's why it is important for everyone married 
and those who are not married and those who are yet to get married or those who are in marriage and departed to have an understanding of the impact of covenants on their relationships because a covenant will dictate a lot of things uh, in our lives because it gives direction to our lives and it has stipulations and because of that everyone that is in a covenant cannot escape the victimization when you are outside the cycle of the covenant we said when you break a covenant, the covenant breaks you. You can become a victim of the same covenant you made. A covenant attracts blessing. It attracts good things, welfare. It attracts sound health, and prosperity, and good things if it is well observed in your relationships. But a covenant can work in the inverse. It can work opposite to what it was stipulated because covenants have an everlasting impact on one's life. A covenant we said cannot be revoked. That's why God said, we saw you this morning, he says the word that I spoke, it will bear its fruit. It will never return back to me void. That word will be accomplished. It will give seed to the sower and it will give bread to the eater. It is God who first instituted marriage and we have seen we don't have to belabor that so much. We have seen that the act of God breaking the rib of Adam and creating Eve out of the rib, it was an act of the covenant because he would have gotten Eve from any other animal that was there or from creating her from the soil. But because it was intended to be a binding relationship, God had to bring the woman from the man. And after bringing the woman from the man, God instituted a law. He said, and he witnessed that law that says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and they cleave to his wife, and the two shall be one. So covenants are very important stipulations in our relationships. Now, it is important to know also that um, many marriages become casualties because of demonic activities, or attacks that release all kinds of challenges, strives, battles, sicknesses, diseases. Because one, when you are in covenant and you desire to walk as God intends for you, we say the devil will fight you so that he may reach God. The reason why we have battles in marriages, in relationships, is because you have a purpose. You have an intent. You are to fulfill God's divine agenda. You are created in the image of God. And God is desiring to have a righteous seed out of you. But then the devil plants the seed of treachery to try and destroy that which God has intended in your marriages. And therefore, it is your responsibility to make sure that you are properly guarding 
that covenant. That's why men are the guardians of the covenant of marriage. You are supposed to be the steward of that which God has entrusted in your life. That's why when Adam, okay, when Eve negotiated with the devil and eventually ate of the tree in the garden of Eden, God did not interrogate Eve because God is a God of order. God is a God of protocol and he doesn't violate his protocols. He knows that the man is the head and is the man who should be ahead all the time. And so when the man is silent and not able to defend the agreement that God has made, the covenant that God has made with his family, then he fails the responsibility that God has given unto him. So God never interrogated Eve. And as it was in the garden, God will never interrogate your wife for any failures in your marriage. It is not your wife that is answerable. It is the man of the house that is answerable in all situations. So let's not keep blaming because the only uh, answer that Adam gave to God when God interrogated him is he blamed the wife. And because of blaming the wife, he was kicked out because men are not supposed to be blamers. God wanted Adam to take responsibility and say, I'm sorry. I didn't have time to teach my wife on what they should do, but because now it has come before time, I'm sorry and I ask you to pardon us. Please forgive me for not taking my position rightly. When a man takes responsibility in his house, he invokes divine power and empowerment because you have become a custodian indeed of that which God has done. So, many marriages become casualties because they have allowed the devil to interfere with the uh, divine intent of God. And when you allow, I say allow, because the Bible says, do not give Satan a foothold. And it's very easy because the devil is a deceiver. And he can deceive. And then in the process of deception, we open a door for attacks. But if you are careful, as a man, you build the hedge of your house. Is somebody listening to me this night? You must be the builder of the hedge of protection around your family. It should not be your wife that is always praying only. The man should be the number one intercessor for the family. It is you that should be talking to God about your family. Your wife is a support system. But you are supposed to be the priest of the house. And the priest is an intercessor. An intercessor simply means he that stands between God and men. And as a house priest, you are supposed to have an altar in that house. So that you maintain the covenant of God in that house. That when the enemy interferes or tries to enter in, he will find that the house is well guarded. Is somebody listening to me? Jesus said that when a strong man guards his house very well, strongly, nobody can come and take over his property and his house. But when he allows a stronger than he to come, then he is bound and he is conquered. It is important for us as men to know 
that we are the custodians, we are the protectors, we are the strong men in that house, we are the high priests of the house, we are the ones that need to hear what is God saying about my family. And once you do that, then you will know how to defend your family from victimization. Somebody shout, Amen. Now, the covenant we saw in the Garden of Eden, it involved blood. It is also important to understand that covenants include direct requirement of establishing a voice in that relationship. It is the blood that is a, that releases the voice in that family. That's why Abraham, as a man that God had called uh, and promised great things, the Bible says he was going about doing whatever he was doing. But he always remembered that God said to him, leave your people and follow me. And after you follow me, I will show you. I will give you all these things. I will bless you. So at the back of his mind, he knew, I am uh, carrying a promise from God. But when and how this was going to be accomplished, he didn't know. Until now, God came, come, came to him in uh, Genesis 15 verse 1 and he told him I can see you are getting anxious I can see you are getting afraid he says do not be afraid Abram I am your shield and your exceeding great reward I am your shield I will protect you I will keep you I will make sure that nothing evil happens to you. I am number two, you are exceeding great reward. But that alone did not satisfy Abraham because Abraham was looking for a more concrete thing. And so he said, but you are telling me all these things. He says, you said you will give me, I mean, what will you give me seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. We know the whole story. Now, when he insisted, then the Bible says God gave him a stipulation because he and God understood that this man in that time for men to have an irrevocable agreement, there was need to have an, a covenant. And all this time, God has not really entered into a more concrete agreement or a covenant together with Abram. And so God tells him, this is now what I want you to go and do. Verse 7, he says, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur. Verse number 8, and he said, Lord, how, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So God said to him, bring me three uh, old, all these things. Say, go get animals. Out of your flock, bring me a three-year-old heifer. Bring a three-year-old female goat. Bring a three-year-old ram. Bring a turtle dove and bring a young pigeon. In other words, go collect that which is the best among what you have. It has got to be a specific age, three year old. Then bring it to me. Now, when you bring it, establish an altar. You will need to slaughter these animals. And the Bible says, cut them in two in the middle and place each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. In other words, a covenant is specifically cut. And so the Bible says, 
He was told this is how we are going to work with this. And Abraham collected animals, three year old, as was given the instructions, and brought those animals, cut them, slaughtered them, skinned them up, and cut them in halves, and set them in halves. And then arranged them in a way that the they, they, they are in one line. And so the Bible says he didn't know when God is going to come because this was now going to be a very serious exercise that he as Abraham must contribute something and God must contribute something. In a covenant, the two parties contribute something to bring the bond together so that there is a proper bonding is somebody listening to me and so the bible says he cut those animals and remember this the blood was coming from those animals and most of the blood because it was cut into it the blood was in between all these animals and god came and spoke to him but when, okay, before God came, there was a, an exercise that Adam had to take, and Abraham had to take. He had to make sure that whatever he is offering to God is not uh, interfered with by vultures. Because there will be vultures that will try to come and mess up with the covenant. Did you hear me? I say again, there will always be vultures that are waiting to come and interfere with the covenant sacrifice. And so the Bible says he was alert when vultures would come. This old man who was almost a hundred years would run and chase away vultures. And it took a long time. We don't know how much time but it was not a short time the bible says by evening he was so tired and he began to sleep and God spoke to him now to cut the whole story short the bible says that as God gave him a covenant and spoke to him he said as for me this is what is going to happen the first thing is I'm going to multiply your seed they shall be as numerous as the stars in the heavens. I'm also going to make sure that there are as many as the sons of the sea. And he gave him all these covenants. He said, I'll bless you. Your children will be taken out of this nation. They'll be out into another nation for 400 years. Because I'm developing them into a nation that is a unique nation. But as for you, your time will come when you close your eyes and join up with your, el your elders. But this is what I am doing right now. I am entering a covenant which is a perpetual covenant between you and me and your descendants. Because that's what God does. Every covenant God enters in, he enters a covenant together with the children of your children. So what you begin today as a father and a mother, you need to know it has a very direct implication and impact on the children of your children. What you put in motion today will continue to the generations to come. And it is you that is removing or, or dividing whatever happened to your ancestors and whatever happens to your children you have the right to decide what happens. Do I allow the things that happened in my father's house, in my grandfather's house, and in my great-grandfather's house to continue into the generations to come? Or do I stop it? It is the covenant that sets the boundary. Did you hear me? I say it is the covenant you enter into that sets the boundaries. That's why for Jesus to break the old covenant order or the, 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 uh, the 
Other than Moses, the Mosaic kind of covenant that happened, it took the blood to set up a bridge so that whatever he was doing, it started a new order of events. A marriage covenant should be set in such a way that you are setting a new order in your home and family. Somebody shout amen. That's why you have to be careful with how you live together with the wife of your youth. The Bible says enjoy life with the wife of your youth because you are setting a precedence so that whatever your parents did that was not right, it should stop with you and you begin a new generation. Somebody shout, I hear you. So, the Bible says, as Abraham was waiting, it came to a night. Darkness came. Bible says, thick darkness came. And when that happened, God himself came down from heaven. And like a torch. The Bible says he appeared like a smoking oven and a burning torch. And the Bible says he passed between those two pieces. God passed between those two pieces. And when he passed between, he was involving himself in the blood covenant that had been offered by Abraham. He went between. So, as he did that, he received the, the blood of the covenant and because of that, it was sealed that whatever he promised Abraham, it is irrevocable. Somebody shout amen. That's why it does not matter what his mother is doing today. It does not matter what the people are doing in the Middle East against the children of Israel. The fact remains one. God has given that nation to the children of Israel and there is no revocation. They cannot revoke it. So, God promised it. And it has been set and established. So in marriage covenant, we also must understand that our relationship is signed and sealed by blood. Say amen. Whether you knew it or you didn't, I say this morning that what you need to know is that there are certain things that are involved in covenant. One is words of promise. Words that are coming from one's mouth. The Bible says in Proverbs 6 that you are ensnared by the words of your mouth. When you make a decree especially a promise in the area of relationships you have ensnared yourself when that girl says yes by the word of her mouth she has ensnared herself to the words you spoke and number two there are now journeys that you begin together. That's why there are marriages that I mentioned last time I talked freely about it. I said this. There are marriages that were uh, they were dedicated on an altar where a priest, a man of God was and you made vows before God. But there are also marriages that have been made either in the legal systems of a nation. That means you went to a legal officer, to a court, and you made vows and you are given a certificate. 
or there are marriages that we call come, we stay. But whichever marriage it is, you have to understand that once you say come, we stay, everywhere you go, people will begin to say, John is the husband of Mar Ma Ma Margaret. True or false? Huh? You will go places with somebody and you say, so and so is my husband. You have agreed in your spirit. You have come into compromise and understanding that this man is my husband. And this one is my wife. Your parents recognize it. Your brothers recognize it. Your neighbors recognize it. There are people around you who recognize, even in your church, the pastor looking at you will say, that is so and so's wife, even though there is no spiritual legality in it. What I mean by spiritual legality is that heaven has not sanctioned it in the sense of dedicating that marriage as a covenant to God. However, before men, it is already a covenant. That's why you're bearing children and children are calling you daddy and mommy. So your marriage, whether you like it or not, is in a covenant. Shout amen. It is in a covenant. You made a covenant to each other. Now, how do you consummate a covenant? Is exactly what Abraham and God did. That's what they did to consummate their relationship. The relationship between Abraham and Adam. I mean, Abraham and God. The Bible says there was an area where the lesser provided the meat and the blood. And God, the greater, came in to receive it, accepted it, and walked through the blood. And because of that, that was a seal, and it is irrevocable. Shout amen. The day you agree with that girl that I am going to marry you, and she is in agreement with you, you have accepted it, and you have agreed that this is going to be my wife, there will be the same act that took place in that garden where God was together with Abraham. You will go and sleep on the same bed together, and the man will go through those two pieces of meat, and blood will be released. And because of that blood, a covenant or a soul tie. The emotions are tied together. Your spirits are tied together. Your bodies, the blood, the blood of the bodies are knit together in that consummation of intercourse. And that one is irrevocable. So whether you hate her or you don't like whatever she did, that act is recorded as a blood covenant. You're quiet on me today. <laughs> Are you listening to me? Though you did it outside the will of God, it is supposed to be now rededicated to God because it was not what God intended. That's why we advise, if you are not married, Get your marriage dedicated before you get it consummated. Because a covenant must be entered into, which is a marriage covenant that attracts God's blessing. But when you do anything that is not dedicated, accepted, and sanctioned by God, what happens is you will live well, but there will always be something at the back of your mind that says that this was not right. And the devil can use 
that kind of situation for any purpose and reason to keep tearing you apart. Okay? That's why you'll find your husband waking up in the morning and says, after all, I'm sick to talk kuna wengine likuwa now. That's why a girl or a wife will wake up in the morning and say, after all, we're seeing one number of because there's no respect. There's no respect. There's no respect. If you are truly in covenant before God, you will know that God has been witnessing this. And I have to respect it. And you have the witness of not only the blood of the two of you, but you also have the witness of the blood that watched over the exercise. Because blood has a voice. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 5 verse 7. For there are three that bear witness in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one, verse 8. And there are three that bear witness on earth. The Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. So the blood is also carrying witness because the most sacred thing in a relationship is the involvement of the blood. It is that involvement of the blood and we have to honor the blood because if you don't honor the blood, the blood can work against you. That's why even in your traditions, if somebody sheds blood, they have to go and cleanse them. They must go and do a ritual to silence that blood. Because the voice of that blood will continue speaking and making demands and asking for revenge in the family. If any one of you in the family killed somebody in the bush, that blood will always cry for revenge. That's why in your traditions, they will never allow you to sit with everybody else until you are cleansed and washed away so that you are, that blood is silenced. We will continue tomorrow morning. I'll tell you, I'll show you what the Bible says about all this. But you need to know that the blood stands as a powerful sacred witness on earth and before God and before the demonic world. The blood. The blood is a great witness. That's why Genesis 4.10, the Bible says, and God asked uh, Cain, what have you done? Because the voice of your brother's blood cries unto me from the ground. Hebrews chapter 12 Verse number 24. The Bible says, we have come to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and we have come to the blood of sprinkling that speaks of better things than that of Abel. So there is a blood of sprinkling. There is a blood that speaks. Now, the first blood, that's why in certain traditions, even to date, especially Islamic traditions, for them to test to know whether the girl you have married is a virgin, they will make sure that the night you spend together after the wedding, there are ladies who will come and pick the bed sheets to confirm whether this girl was a virgin because they want to see if there is blood on that sheet. It is something that is to speak in your marriage. So, blood speaks. Leviticus 17, verse number, 20, verse number 11. The Bible says, For the life of a creature is in the blood. And I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. So, the life of a marriage is also in the blood. That life is in the blood. 
And it is that blood that is the sacred, the most sacred thing in your covenant relationship in marriage. Now, that's why if you are married 40 years, 50 years, 70 years, what must keep you is not the money your husband earns. What must keep you is not the job your wife is doing. What should keep you is not the kind of children you have born. It is the voice of that blood that should be honored and respected every time. Because marriage bed must be honored. That's what the Bible says. Let the marriage bed be honorable. It should be honored. Why does the Bible say, let the marriage bed be honored? Because the marriage bed is the altar upon which the blood is transfused. You are quiet on me tonight. I say again, the marriage bed is the altar upon which the blood is transfused. I don't know how many times a week or how many times a month or how many times a year but that is the place where you transmit your blood to each other every time you meet. It is a sacred place. It is not a place that you take another person. Never. It is sacrilege for you to take another person on the bed of marriage. Because that is an altar. God has commanded that bed should be honored. Now, when the Bible talks about the bed, it's not just talking about a physical bed. The moment you entered into that relationship, you carry the marriage bed everywhere you go. If you are going to sleep in a bed in South Africa and your wife is not there, the moment you enter that house, the marriage bed enters that house. Listen, let me put it this way. If the judge of a high court must sit a court, even if it is under a tree, the moment he raises and he says we are going to have a court in your lender under a tree, the moment he reaches there, that is where the court is. Hello? The moment he reaches there, that's where the court is. So, husband, everywhere you step, if you enter another man's house and you sleep in it, he has given you a bed. That room becomes your marriage room. In the spirit realm. Because there is an order of a covenant pursuing you. So you can't say, this is not my marriage bed. Therefore, I can sleep with any prostitute on this bed. Never. Everywhere you enter, your presence sanctifies the place. Hello? I say every place you go, your presence sanctifies that place. You enter a bedroom in the hotel, immediately the angel of your marriage goes in that room with you. Because every covenant is watched over, is enforced by angelic forces and is also supervised by demonic forces. When you enter a covenant, there is an angel that is given responsibility to supervise your life. To supervise that marriage. There are demons that are also given assignment to make sure that whatever you say to each other doesn't happen. It is you who must not give the devil the room. So every place you enter, as a wife, whether you have gone to a seminar with a thousand men who are so 
powerful, macho men, full of money, and they tell you, after all, your husband is not here, you need to know that your husband never leaves you. Did you hear me? I say your husband never leaves you. You are one. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says, and the two shall become one. The two shall become one. Jesus says it in Mark chapter 10. He says, people ask, can we divorce? He said, this is not what it was in the beginning. God created them male and female and he brought them together and he said, for man shall leave his wife, has, sorry, shall leave his mother and the father and they shall join to his wife and the two shall be one. So, geokia mwenzako mwambie, hakuna wakati mme wako anakuacha na hakuna wakati mke wako anakuacha. If I take a plane and I leave to go to America alone, I go to a hotel. I'll be ministered to by beautiful women. Very beautiful. They will bring food in my bed, my bedroom. They will come and clean the room. They will change the bed sheets of the bed. But according to me, my wife is there with me. And because of that, it doesn't matter whether it is 10,000 kilometers apart, she is there present. Because the blood of the covenant carries the spirit of our marriage. <laughs> I say the blood of the covenant carries the spirit of our marriage. That's why the Bible is very clear. It says you shall not deny yourselves. Musinimane. Because that's how you renew your covenants every time. Yeah, unanielewa. So kila mahali unapoenda wabeba mkeo. Kila mahali unapoenda wabeba mmeo. Usikae pale ukafikiri ya kwamba o oh, huyu mzee leo hayuko ataniona. Wacha nijienjoy. Hakuna kitu unajienjoy. Wewe jaribu uone. Mnamaliza ilikuwa raha wakati bado ilikuwa mdomoni, lakini baada ya kumeza ndipo unaanza kujuta kwa sababu inakuwa chungu kwa tumbo. Bana ni agano. Ni tamu domoni lakini chungu tumboni. That's when you begin to feel guilty. Hata mkakutana leo hawezi kumwangalia macho kwa macho. Kwa sababu haukumika malaika anayechunguza ndoa yako ameangalia akaona huyu mwanamke ni kahaba. Sema haleluya. Malaika anayeangalia ndoa yako anapokuangalia wewe kama mwanaume unayezunguka na wasichana ovyo ovyo barabara vinyangarika <laughs> akikuangalia hivi anaona huyu ni pimpu mbovu kabisa Hana maana kwa sababu gani hauelewi maana ya gano la ndoa Lazima utilie maanani hii agano ya ndoa hii si ya kucheza cheza na vitu vingine Sema ninapona Sijakusikia baba <laughs> So know that you are one You are what You are one so haijalishi kama uko peke yako ama mkona nani 
you are one ndio sababu kwa gari langu nikiwa peke yangu na labda isipokuwa awe ni my blood daughter my biological daughter hakuna mwanamke mwingine anaruhusa kama mimi na drive akae kando yangu hana ruhusa bana sifiwe hana ruhusa only my wife has that right when i'm driving a cab no other woman has that right none no other woman has any right to sleep on my bed with me none hiyo ni marufuku hata kadhubutu namna gani haitawezekana na hichawezekana miaka 33 ya kuolewa hakuna mwanamke amelala kando ya mimi kwa kitanda yeyote dunia hii Are you listening to me? Because this is not a joking matter. It carries heavy punishment. Carries heavy punishment. Shout amen. Nikimalizia ndio sababu wakati wa harusi kama harusi ilifanywa kihalali na vizuri lazima mnaenda kunegotiate mahari na wazazi wa msichana lazima hapa hatutakufunganisha harusi bila barua ya baba na mama ama guardian ya mke wako ambayo unataka kuoa lazima we must know that you have gone to discuss this thing na tujue umelipa mahari ama haujalipa kwa sababu mahari ni sehemu ya hii agano it is part of the covenant ndio sababu baada ya hiyo yote na tumefanya counseling siku ya harusi hapa hivi ni kwa sababu wakati ule tulikuwa tunaingilia na ile mlango nitakana sasa naingia na hii mlango bwana pewe sifa ili nyinyi mnakuja hapa katikati wazazi wenu wanakaa wengine huku wengine wanakaa pande hii mnapita katikati yao mkisha fika hapa lazima mpewe ile inaitwa maagano na katika kabila zingine hakuna mahari ambayo utalipwa utalipa ukitoka na ngombe kwenu kama mwanaume unapeleka mahari kwa mke wako ukifika huko watachinja ngombe ingine ama wachinje one of the cows wakumpatie inaitwa nini mguu ile paja la, la nyuma wanakwambia beba hiyo rudi nayo kwenu kwa sababu is part of the covenant. Bwana sifiwe. Ama watakupatia some things for you to go back with because there must be exchange. A marriage covenant does not end with you and your wife. A marriage covenant is between two families and two clans and the two communities. They must honor it and recognize it. If your father-in-law does not recognize your marriage, there is something wrong with that marriage. Your mother-in-law must recognize your marriage. And in where I come from, we can only recognize that you are officially married kwa sababu ngombe ya kutoka kwenu ilikojoa kwa sisi letu nyumbani. <laughs> Hello? Ngombe ilibebwa ikaletwa. Ikaonekana tukachinja. Baada ya kuchinja tukala pamoja, tukasherehekea, tukaimba, tukakata keki pamoja, tukajua ya kwamba huyu msichana sasa si wetu peke yetu lakini ni wa mwenzake ameoa ameolewa kwa hivyo akienda huko katika maagano wakiwa na shida 
will only be distant consultants, but will not, never be judges of it. Are you listening to me? It is our job as parents to reconcile them and to teach them the right way to go. Because they are in covenant. Nothing has permission to break them or do them apart. Only one thing has power to do you part. It is called death. Death. Death, death, death. And I said, tonight, we're going to find out whether the devil that you serve or the God that I serve has more power. We believe in the healing gospel that must be preached through high quality media production and the latest cinematic technology reaching the unreached all over the world. The word taught, revealed, expanded, expounded and embedded deep into the heart of mankind awakens the mind to focus rightfully. Yes, darkness cannot stand in the way of the light and the light of the world is here. Walk in the light and live a good life. Watch Redeemer's Voice TV available on Bamba TV, Go TV, Stir Times and digital free to air decoders and TVs. Redeemer's Voice TV bringing the liberating truth.